Okay, so yesterday we were talking about uh, magneto speed to engine speed. The big takeaway with that is uh, one, who cares? Um, <laughs> two, it's dependent upon how many cylinders, cylinders how many, more importantly for the magneto, how many holes. holes it has. But also we determined that if a rotor has two poles, then the cam should have two, two, two lobes. lobes. If it has four poles, it would have four lobes. Four lobes. Four lobes. Okay. Um, now looking at the distributor end, this is important. For every two, how many revolutions does it take to fire all cylinders? Two. Two revolutions to fire all cylinders. How many revolutions does the distributor gear make to fire all cylinders? One. One. Okay, it's easy math. Doesn't matter how many cylinders there are, doesn't matter how many poles there are, doesn't matter about anything. The distributor goes around one time to fire all the cylinders because this represents all of the cylinders. And it'll fire this one, then that one, then that one, then that one, then that one. When it gets back around to this one, the engine has gone around twice. Twice, twice. all right. So uh, distributor rotor, nope. will rotate, let's say, 360 degrees to fire all cylinders. I think it's one minute. So it turns at one half crank speed. Turns at one half crank speed. Or same as, same as cam. Cam shaft to be precise. All right, moving on. <clears throat> some magnetos are very, very different. And so some of them have to have what's called a compensated cam. And that's where we take the $100 bill and give it to the cam. And you know, you've been compensated. So here's a compensated cam right here. And the reason why the cam has to be compensated, and you can't really tell by looking at this, but this came out of an R2800. And I know that because it says right on there, R2800. That's a radial engine. Uh, so radial engine and it has a little dot on it on one of the lobes and that lobe represents the number one cylinder and believe it or not all of the little lobes are not evenly spaced because radial engines we'll go back a flat engine or horizontally opposed or all pretty much all other engines the cylinders fire at an exact number of degrees apart but in a radial, because they move, it moves kind of in an eccentric way inside the way it only has a single throw crankshaft because all the cylinders are in a line. We'll talk about that next semester. Each cylinder does not fire in the exact same degrees from the next. Some of them are a little bit ahead, some a little behind. And so if we didn't have a compensated cam, one cylinder might fire at say 25 degrees, the neck fires at 26, the next one might be 28, the next one back, back on 25. So a compensated cam actually switches when the breaker points are gonna open to allow for the differences in radial engines. And so you have to time it so that not only are you setting, uh, well, you just time it so it's on number one cylinder and boom, that when you set it up, you have a little dot that goes with number one cylinder. So. Uh, and that is about a half a page of notes right there, which I don't know. So in a radial engine, because of the way the master and link rods are connected, the path of each rod is elliptical. See, in a nine cylinder radial, you would expect each piston to reach top dead center every 40 degrees, which is 360 divided by nine, but some cylinders a little more than 40 and some are a little less than 40 degrees. If we use a typical symmetrical cam, the spark would not be correct for each cylinder. To correct for this, a compensated cam is used. Compensated cam has the lobes properly spaced with the uh, properly spaced with the number one cylinder on the lobe, properly marked. 
<coughs> compensated cam must then be driven off distributed gear, which turns at one half crankshaft speed. So, there we go. Compensated cam, let's see, we'll just put used on radials. Used on radial engines. And we can say has the, um, has lobes, has lobes appropriately. Paste to match um, what elliptical movement of crankshaft. That wasn't too abbreviated, was it? <clears throat> That's the gist of it. When we talk about engines, we have an engine firing order. <clears throat> and four-cylinder opposed engines for aircraft that fires the number one cylinder, then the number three, one, three, two, four. One, three, two, four. It's right, right, left, left, or left, left, right, right. So one, three, two, four. Uh, six cylinders are different between the manufacturers, and I can never remember. I always have to look at it. But anyway, so that's how the firing order goes, right? So it's not one, two, three, four. It's one, then three, then two, then four. Firing order of a Nine cylinder radial will be one, then three, then five, then seven, then nine, then two, then four, then six, then eight, then back to one. Follow? Okay. So magnetos also have a firing order. And that firing order is really easy to remember. For a four cylinder magneto, it would be one, two, three, four. If it was a six cylinder magneto, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So the firing order of the magneto references basically just, it fires not the cylinder, but it fires one, two, three, four. You just count it like that. So here I have an old Bendix lunchbox magneto. Why do they call them lunchbox magnetos? Yeah, my grandpa had a lunchbox. It looked very much like this. Left it open, a bigger sandwich in there. But old style lunchbox magneto. Uh, the shop that I worked at, I don't know, there were not a lot of shops would overhaul these, but we did. So we overhauled a lot of these. And uh, this wasn't me overhauling them. I mean, I eventually did, but and then I did fix this problem. But you can't see it, but there's little places. So if we did them authentic, and we did, we had these little white little numbers would go right up here next to each one of these towers. So where the tower comes, that's where the ignition leads go. And to build them authentic, we would put the little numbers. And the numbers on there, one, two, three, four, would represent the firing order of the magneto. So it would show you which one would fire first, and the second one, and then the third, and the fourth. And so we would build these, and we'd send them out. And inevitably, you'd get a call. you send them out on Friday, and you get the call Monday. Hey, this magneto you sent us doesn't work with the crap. Yeah, we'll switch the two leads. Huh? You put the one to the one cylinder, then the two to the two cylinder, didn't you? Well, yeah. Well, that's the firing order of the magneto. You have to make the firing order of the magneto match the one of the engines. So one goes to one, two goes to three, three goes to two, four goes to four. Switch the middle two and you'll be fine, you see? <laughs> so, oh. And finally I went to the boss and said, how come we don't like put a tag on them that just says that? I mean, wouldn't that just solve a lot of frustration and Good point. So we did that. But anyway, so firing order of the magneto. That's what the firing order of the magneto is. Uh, it's always one, two, three, four, dot, dot, dot. That's how that works. I don't know what that's going to do. A U, good. Okay, that's exactly what I was hoping it would do. You can't do like a dot, then a dot, then a dot. What is that going to be? Because you're drawing double ops. I know. I was trying to. You have to do the squares. Oh. I did it. Just one little. Just. One, two, three, one, two, thirty-four, just like that. Uh, number one, okay. A lot of cylinders. Ah. Uh, 
Uh, the number one cylinder, the number one cylinder is usually clearly marked. clearly marked all right moving on magneto firing order there is a thing called a safety gap can we have a gap for jesus <laughs> oh i gotta tell my daughter that she's gonna love that <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Okay. Safety gap. <clears throat> I have never actually seen a safety gap, and I've built a fair amount of magnetos. I am assuming that the safety gap is something that goes in old, older radial engines. But here's the thing about all magnetos. When I sit up here with a magneto that's got an impulse coupling on, and I'm snapping it and having some fun with it, what am I doing? You're creating electricity. How many volts am I creating in the secondary? You're creating well, about 12 to 40,000 volts. And where do they go? Where is that voltage going? Into the Nowhere. air. Nowhere. So it's building up inside of the coil looking for a place to go out. And so if it can find a place, it'll make a place. And once it makes a place to go out, now we've got a track to come out and I've ruined the coil or I've started to create a carbon track or something inside the magneto. So it's really bad to run a magneto without something on the secondary to actually give it a place to go to dissipate that electricity. So a safety gap is an internal gap that, like I said, I've never seen one, but in, in what I imagine it is it's a gap that is electrically larger than the spark plug but a gap that's kind of at the upper end of its voltage limit. So if I was sitting there doing that, that safety gap would at least have a place to go to the case and hopefully maybe to the case and shock the person doing it so they would know to stop doing it. And then you drop it. So, um, so it gives the secondary a place to go. So some magnetos incorporate an internal gap that would give the secondary an alternate method to discharge the spark in the event of an open at the spark plug. So the safety gap, why, why would they need a safety gap on the, on the airplane? Would it, it's internal to the magneto. But would, why would they create it? It's not just for like when people are playing with magnetos, is it? Well, like I said, or if the, there was an open at the spark plug. Oh, okay. Like a failure of an ignition lead or something. Oh, right. All right, so some magnetos. Uh, incorporate. I knew I messed it up the minute I wrote it. Incorporate. There we got it. Um, an internal gap and internal. internal gap that would give the secondary or that gives the secondary an alternate method to discharge the spark in the event of an open at the spark plug. put it's bad to run the magneto bad for the magneto operate without plugs or wires or at least a path to ground for the secondary and I mentioned that so safety gap coming in speed the coming in speed 
that is the speed at which the magneto needs to be operated at to consistently spark all of the cylinders or all of the <clears throat> all of the wires it's set by the manufacturer and it's a way to show that the magneto is airworthy you test it to an airworthy standard so uh, you saw it today we had two people run the magnetos so I ran the magneto and the way i always did it is i would you know, take the magneto start it up and go to a, a a higher speed, a couple hundred RPM, 100, one, uh, yeah, 200, 300. So it consistently spark, just right off the bat, just let it all consistently spark. Um, sometimes you get a little dust on the points of the machine, you get a little bit of something on the points, you just clean off everything, let it kind of burn in a little bit, if you will, and then back it all the way back down to see how low you can go. If you're doing this in the field, all you got to do is just 150 is for Bendix. It, everything has to spark by the time you get to 150. So if you do it in the field, back it off to 100. Everything should fire just fine at 100. If it fires at 100, you don't have to sit there and like, how slow can I go? Because you're getting paid by the hour and by the piece. And so, you know, you got to get it done. But as long as it's below 150, you're good. doesn't matter if it's 20 or 40. If it's below 150, you're good. Uh, anything below that is just bragging rights. So coming in speed is... Uh, the speed at which the magneto speed at which the magneto will consistently fire Consistently fire all leads at a specific gap. Now that gap is specified in the maintenance manual or overhaul manual. You can't just make up a gap. You got to actually have the right thing. So it's different for each model. For each, I'll just say Magneto. But I'm pretty sure that Bendix is 150. This is memory. I think all Bendix is 150. And I'm pretty sure that Slick is 250. Um, if you're working on an airplane, magnetos do need to be cooled. RPMs. And a magneto firing order, yet again, which is? <laughs> All right, magneto cooling. How are magnetos cooled? Air. Air. Where are you going to get air? Outside. Outside air. All right, so magnetos there are cooled. Uh, big bore continentals, 470s, 520s, 550s were the in the pilot passenger they're going to face this way inside the airplane so now we're going to turn the airplane around we're looking at the front of the airplane you have the cowling openings you got the propeller cowling openings you just look right in and whoosh so all the cool air comes in the front of the cowling goes on top of the cylinders hits the magneto goes down through the cylinders and out the bottom so they get cooling that way so they get cooled real well on continentals <clears throat> uh, all the other continentals and all the other light combings they're going to sit behind the engine, kind of down in the back in the accessory case section, behind a piece of metal 
that deflects air into the cylinders. So back in the accessory section for engines, there's not a lot of cooling going on back there. So you'll see sometimes often blast tubes where you have a, um, like a sheet metal, piece of sheet metal that's blocking the air from coming from the in front of the engine and makes, makes it go down the cylinders. Well, this is behind that. So what they do is they drill a little hole and just run a little tube and they'll have a metal tube running right at it or even sometimes a flexible tube or hose just right at it. It's like, what's that for? And it's to cool the magneto. They get hot. Um, <clears throat> with uh, cool the magneto, is there a pro um, So does it, does it, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this. Um, if the engine is oper engine operating temperature, I'll give you my scenario that I'm okay. thinking of right now. My engine operating temperature is 260 degrees. Um, I think that's what it is, <clears throat> 260 or 280. I can't remember. It's not. Now. It's hot, but but when I, in the, in the What movie, is 260? Uh, <coughs> See, on, an, on, an, on your engine, you can, there are only two things that are measured. Well, three, but they wouldn't do it. The exhaust gas, not going to happen on a little engine like that normally. So you have cylinder head temp, which is going to run somewhere in the mid-30s. So between like 350, around 350 to 400. Um, and then you have the oil temp, which is going to be about 170 to 190. Yeah, so it's oil temp on mine. Okay. So in the winter time, we have to plug up some of the intake holes. There's actually a service bulletin about it. 85, right? 65. 65. So 65s and 85s, Continental C85s and A65s, they're old engines. They have a funny little quirk, speaking of blast tubes. They have one blast, there's a, in the back of the engine down low, there's an oil screen. And in that oil screen, there's a temperature bulb that sticks in there. And then if you'll notice, there is a blast tube that blasts right on the temperature bulb. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, well. So this kind of brings me to a question. Because Kit Solder Green has has the same airplane. Okay. Almost yeah. verbatim. It's, it's, yeah. it's exact. And he covered his. He has that blast tube. I have the blast, or he doesn't have the blast tube. I have the blast tube, but it's. I think it's going. I can't remember now. I, have to, I haven't looked at the airplane in a long time, but it's covered up completely on his. If not, if it isn't even there. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if. Because I was, you know, trying to figure out how to cover those holes, and I created a, a, mm -hmm. a baffle that would not cover the glass tube hole. Okay. So I could still get some air ramming in there, but still cover a lot of the thing. And I'm wondering about, like, magneto cooling. So, like, if you took that out, like in Kit's airplane, is that to help cool the magnetos and you take it yeah. out? Yeah, but sudden... they're specific. They go to the magneto. So if you only got one blast tube and it goes down to the oil temp bulb and your oil temp isn't getting to 180, I'd cover it up. My airplane came with a winterization kit that plugs the front, the holes in the front of the airplane. Instead of being this big, they're only that big. Uh -huh. But I don't use those. So if it's not going to this magneto, it's probably totally fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And we've already talked about dual magnetos or a dual magneto. If you do a dual magneto, it makes more sense. And so a dual magneto is what? Two magnetos in one. And that was the Bendix, well, there was the D2000. And there was an AD that said, throw it away. And then they went to the Bendix D3000. So they share a common rotor. And I guess you could sell common rotor, cam, and housing. Rotor, cam, and housing. But other than that, everything gets its own thing. So it has its own, well, let's write it out. Each side has its own what? Capacitor and points assembly. Has its own, okay, uh, points, I heard points. Capacitor, 
condenser. What else? Distributor rotor. Right? Distributor and rotor. Coils. Uh, coils. Points, capacitor, distributor, rotor, coils. I think that's it. Everything. They used the rotor rotor twice, so obviously we're talking about the... Oh, did I? Points, capacitor, distributor, and rotor coils. Yeah, but you say share a common rotor, and then you said it's its own. Share a common... Uh, Magnetic rotor. Oh, it's, it's the distributor. The distributor rotor. Magnet rotor. <laughs> Good point. <clears throat> That's because I didn't know. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's talk about some old timey stuff now. What I miss? It's like always <laughs> on your mind, isn't it? It's like, it's like, it's just like, just what? can't wait. I've been making fun of Evan because I called him old. Oh, okay. Because every time I just cause anything he old gets brought up, I just like, <laughs> turn it around. It's like, you're getting two big eyes. There's <laughs> <laughs> two saucers. <laughs> Respect your elders. Oh, I am. He's like, wow. He's like three times my age. <laughs> yeah, you're like 10 years old or something like that. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> All right, older high tension systems. I got this out of some book. I know we're plagued with problems. Well, they had so the older high tension, the old high tension systems had problems. One, they had flashover. So at high altitudes with less dense air, the spark would jump to the wrong cylinder in the distributor. <coughs> there was capacitance of the ignition leads. So flashover. Let me see. Is we talking about the low tension or the high tension? Problems with old high tension systems. It's like a history lesson here. It's it says know. low tension system. I'm just. Uh -oh. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about low tension uh, okay, systems. Okay. The reason we get to low tension systems because of problems with okay, okay. old. Okay. If you stop making fun of the old guy behind you, maybe you pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Flashover, uh, capacitance of the ignition leads. So leads store a certain amount of electricity until the voltage is enough to jump the gap, but higher current, lower voltage, high current, low voltage, uh, heated up the plug and caused premature wear. So we're getting premature wear of the plugs because the capacitance of the ignition leads, that was a problem. Uh, there was moisture. Moisture can create an alternate voltage path. High voltage is more susceptible to escaping and finding a way through something because it'll just kind of force its way through. Reminds me of my dog. Uh, you can even go outside the magneto because you know, wires and stuff weren't as uh, good quality. Um, I know very little about this. Now, high voltage corona sounds cool. High voltage corona, something with your eye. Condition of stress across the conductor. When high voltage is in a conductor and the conductor is near a path to ground, stress is set up. Like it wants to jump to that. It can you know, kind of sense it over there. Hey, I want to go over there. Um, and the conductor is near the path to ground, so stress is set up. The stress can cause a breakdown of the conductor and give the lead a path to ground. And so that E5 tester that you guys are messing with to check your little, that's what that actually is. It's, it, you set it up on your ignition leads during an annual inspection and running the battery and you hit the little button and you look to see if you're putting high voltage through your cable, the ignition cable, and you're looking to see if it finds an alternate path to ground somewhere. I don't typically do that if your ignition leads look that bad. Buy a new one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. I got the high voltage Corona. So low voltage tension systems was the answer. Low, or low tension system. I should say low tension system. Let's keep it consistent. Low tension systems keep the voltage keep the voltage uh, yeah from magneto to cylinder low. I should stop and explain what this is. So we have high tension magneto systems, right? The reason why is because when it leaves here, it is high, high voltage. voltage. So all we'd have to do is make the same thing, but go inside and cut out the secondary coil. That's all we did. Just cut the secondary coil out. Now have it come out of the coil as a primary, which is much lower. Send it to the distributor gear. Send low tension out the spark plug. So now we're only talking, say, 100, 200 volts. Run that all the way up to the cylinder. Then at the cylinder, just put the coil, primary to secondary, a little transformer. And then from that, you just run a very short lead right to the spark plug. And so that would be your low tension system. So low tension all the way out to the cylinder. Then right before the spark plug, you just do another primary, secondary coil transformer. A little. You need to learn right now that when it comes to aviation, that does not matter. <laughs> expense, no expenses are spared. <laughs> does it get expensive? Um, okay, but to, to your point, weight um, and problems with coil. So we're talking about going back in time now. So we're talking about older radial engines. So we're talking about at least nine to 18 cylinders. So if I had an 18-cylinder radial engine, how many coils do I need? 36. 36 per engine. Now, if I got a four-engine bomber or something like that, I got 36 times four. So. That's like a 24-cylinder. 24 24 <laughs> they had four of those on a bomber. Yeah, so yeah, you start to get up there with them. So. so low tension systems keep the voltage from the magnitude of the cylinder low and increase... Voltage um, at the cylinder with uh, independent coils. <coughs> independent coils. <coughs> Yeah, pretty much where the coil is. You still need a primary coil in the magneto to transfer the magnetic energy to low tension electrical energy, send it out to the uh, cylinder, add another coil. So you'd have to add a little coil in the magneto to go from magnetic to electric and then electric out. And then there you go. It's kind of the way cars are run, right? Cars, cars all have coil packs. Yeah. One per yeah. cylinder now at the, so what you send battery voltage up to it. Yeah. So What's that? Everything is the same. You just take out, just surgically go in there, find the secondary, you cut out a little knife, you throw it away, put it all back together. So you just have the same circuit. It's like, but the secondary is missing, and it's just the coil. So coming out of the coil now from the primary, you still go to a distributor, rotor, uh, distributor block, leads. What comes after the leads? Transformer, Transformer coil, then plugs. Just a magneto with extra steps. Yep. All right. Uh, For no particular reason at all, I wanted to switch a high voltage mag to a low, or high 
pinch mag to low pinch mag, I just have to switch that coil out pretty much. And then buy all the other coils? Yes. And then get an STC or an experimental and then then the hardest part is gonna be explain to everybody why you did that. <laughs> <laughs> Retro. Yes. All right. We don't do it anymore because our material sciences and technologies are better now. Let's talk about what you absolutely have to know to be an aircraft mechanic. And maybe you're sitting there saying, like I was saying to myself and I was sitting in class, this doesn't apply to me because I'm going to go work for a large airline, preferably Delta. So I will never work on small airplanes, so I don't know why I'm even learning this at this point, but okay, it's probably on the test, so I guess I'll learn it. And then guess what happened? <laughs> nope, I went to work on small airplanes for my entire career. I ended up overhauling magnetos and such too. So you never know where you're going to end up, but I will promise you this. When I was a mechanic examiner, I don't want to keep telling you the same stories over and over, but when I did it, we were told flat out that we were supposed to interview the applicant and find out where they came from. So in other words, Jack calls me up and he says, hey, I've got my 8610-2, I want to test. They say, tell me, did you come from a school? What? No, I was a helicopter mechanic in the Marines. I was expected to go into my test material and create a test that he would understand. In other words, don't ask him a bunch of magneto questions. Don't ask him a bunch of recep questions. Every question I have should be geared around a turbine and a helicopter, to the best of my ability. But there are some things that I just couldn't do. There are sometimes it's just you get recep ignition systems, and you've got to ask recep ignition. And inevitably, it was, and the easiest thing I think I could do was verify the timing of a magneto on the engine. So I would at least have to say, okay, here's an engine with the magneto already put on. All you have to do is verify that it was done right. And it was like, oh, I'm just, you know, stressed for both of us watching the poor guy, you know, just like, okay, I remember like somebody told me about this, trying to read the manual and do it. So you, you're gonna have to do this. It's just part of the test. And if you can do this, I don't know. It's funny how putting a magneto on the engine and safety wire kind of become the litmus test of if you're a good mechanic or not. I, I don't believe in that, but it's just like whatever. Um, some of the best mechanics I know probably couldn't put a mechanic, put, I haven't seen a magneto on their whole career. All right, this guy, he doesn't work with magnetos, do you? Nope. So he's doing just fine with himself. So all he's got to do is get through the oral practical and he'll be fine. So, all right. So anyway, she, so, you need, to, yeah, you need to have this working understanding of magnetos and how internally they do work. Once, because if you don't understand the internal workings, it doesn't make sense what you're doing next. But you are expected to be able to put a magneto on an engine. It is so simple, yet so complicated. Um, it's like a four-step thing. And yet, it's like some people would just, you know, they're ready to drop out of the program. It's like, I just can't put one on. I'm like, of course you can. So we're going to talk about putting them on and starting systems. So that's where we go. So we'll first talk about the starting systems. Why do we need a starting system? And when I say starting systems, I'm not talking about the starter motor that starts the engine. I'm talking about how are we going to get the spark going here? Because we now know that a Bendix is a pretty good mag. It'll spark at 150 RPM. But we did some math the other day, and we figured out the crankshaft to this is turning it about. You can't turn the engine at 150 RPM with a starter motor or your hand. Yeah, some of the new lightweight starters will kind of do it. But I don't know. It's just not turning quite fast enough. So you can have a hard time. <clears throat> also, uh, fuel-injected engines are so difficult to start. I mean, they are just... You talk, well, talk, I've started a lot of them because um, you have to go, you know, and every time you do an annual, like, go get the engine started up. So fuel-injected engines are just incredibly difficult. You guys get in a car nowadays and push a little button. You know, don't put your foot on the gas or anything. Just push the button and it just starts and it runs, and that's just fantastic. So I don't know, Icon is probably really easy to start too. They're like that yeah, <laughs> with, we, uh, with the fade axe systems and, but... <clears throat> 
G36 out there. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Juan's Bonanza. I mean, Juan's fl literally flown that airplane, practically, well, not literally, but damn near all over the world. And he almost ran the battery out starting it. That's his own personal airplane that he flies like every week. So that's how hard it is to start a fuel injected engine. They're very temperamental. So uh, if you don't have a good spark system, that's going to make things even worse. So you probably, well, why is it hard to start? Uh, because well, we'll get into fuel injection systems, but our fuel injection systems on aircraft aren't pulsed. They're it's continuous slow. flow. So it just right there's a little nozzle right next to the intake at the intake port right before the valve going in the cylinder and it just flows and there's no primer um, we do have some in it. there are some very few airplanes have a priming system um, for fuel injection so what you have to do is you have to use the electric boost pump and you've got to bring the mixture and the throttle to a position that will put fuel into the engine just enough so that you didn't, don't f uh, flood it and enough that you get enough. So you have to get enough, but not so much you flood it. Now there's flooding means that you have put too much fuel for the amount of air available. Okay, flooding is bad. You can take it one step further, and I've actually seen this in my own eyes, where you hydraulic lock an engine. And that's you put so much fluid in there that when the intake valve opens, it draws in enough fuel that when the valve closes, and the piston comes up near top dead center and you have that much room, you got that much fuel. And it, it just destroys the engine. I mean, it's not like that might have destroyed it. I mean, you have pieces and parts just coming out or falling into the oil sump. So malice it is... Malice in the combustion palace. What's that? Malice in the combustion palace. Malice in the combustion palace. Well, in uh, my vernacular, we have an un unscheduled dynamic disassembly. <laughs> So you got to find that mixture, and I don't know, my, my uh, take has always been you give it, I always watch the fuel flow meter, and once it starts to rise, I, that, that's it, because I'd rather not give it enough than give it too much, and then, and then right, I got a procedure. Anyway, <clears throat> it works. So, all right, so we want our magnetos to be able to provide a spark, so that's one less thing we have to deal with. There are really two different types of starting systems, so, but we have to remind ourselves that magnetos... Magnetos have fixed timing. Have fixed. That is not how you spell fixed. Fixed. Ooh, yay, saved it. Fixed timing. Set at around 25 degrees. Now, when I say around 25 degrees, every engine has a very specific number very specific. It just happens to be that they're all around 25. It's 28, 25, 26. Um, so it's just, you know, Lycoming is almost always 25, so throughout 25. Don't say 25. You just did, didn't you? I said read the manual. Read the manual. Yes, read the manual. It's about 25 degrees. Um, before top dead center it's also called TDC top dead center and what top dead center means is and again this is another class we'll get more into it but the crankshaft I was trying to if I had time to pull up some, yeah let's do it there's, there's probably enough here like I don't know what you're talking about and that's okay we'll hit this button and then we'll hit this button and we'll go to this Love this little website. All right. Is there a way I made this bigger? No, I just guess I'll be like that. Okay, so this is a representation, kind of, of a four stroke engine. And by four strokes, it means that that piston will make four trips. One, two, three, four. Four strokes to complete the whole combustion cycle. And the combustion cycle consists of five events. Intake, compression, ignition, and exhaust. 
Power exhaust. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, four. Said five. Five events. Oh, five events. Four strokes. Five events. Four strokes, five events. Right there is power, exhaust. All right, so if we look at what's happening, this is the crankshaft. The crankshaft is over here turning the camshaft. camshaft, and the camshaft has a lobe that pushes on a push rod that, open, that hits the rocker arm that opens the valve. Now, this is not an accurate representation because of a couple things. One, we also would need a push rod over here on this side, so I guess we could have a dual cam engine and put another cam over here and go around and push down, or it just it has to be drawn two-dimensional. Yeah. I think, I think the way they have it for the uh, intake valve is it is it's just a check valve, so it draw, drew in a vacuum, it compresses, the explosion keeps the check valve shut, and then the cam opens, it draws, and then it opens in a vacuum, and that's why it's in the second cam. That's good thinking. Probably they just. That's right, but. Yeah, no, he's very exactly. That would work that way if we put a weak spring on it. But our engines that we use in aviation and automobiles and everything else would never work that way because the springs that hold these valves up are so strong that there's no amount of vacuum is going to suck that thing down. So, and then, you know, what kind of ignition system does this have? Spark. <laughs> Kettering ignition system, battery ignition system, right? So we got the battery goes to a primary coil, wrap around that primary coil, runs down here to a set of points that is operated off of a cam. cam. And so when the cam, the breaker points open, open, there they go, off this little cam right there, then it will kill the field, which will create a high voltage, which will create a spark. So, all right, we've, and this right here is the capacitor. Okay, so we understand that the other thing about this is, oh, I know what I want to show you. I was talking about top dead center. But so, in that system, yeah? is it actually operating off that same cam that's, that's moving the valves, or is it a separate No, it's a separate one. There's a little flat spot right here. Right there, see that flat spot? Okay. That's what's doing it. And so when it hits the flat spot, it closes. And then... So that, that, fires, that fires a spark through the ground? Open. Flat, base, open. Like, yeah. Instead of, I guess... Um, okay. Well, what I want to talk about is... So it's, we all understand top dead center. So... This doesn't work quite right. Top dead means that there is a perfect alignment between all of these things right here. So if I were to push on that piston, it would push straight down through this connecting rod onto the crankshaft and it wouldn't rotate it either which way. It is perfectly and totally in line. Anything off of top dead center, and that's a lot of movement right there really, then it would start pushing it the uh, crankshaft that way or crankshaft that way. Got it? So that's top dead center is when everything is perfectly aligned and bottom dead center is the same thing when everything is perfectly aligned. And it's a very exact specific spot on an engine. It's not like, oh, the piston's about at the top. Oh, it has to be exactly, perfectly to the degree top dead center. It can't be one degree this way or one degree that way. Top dead center is top dead center. That's how we have to measure things. So I wanted you to figure that out. All right, break time.